Hi, welcome to the third clip of this week's uh, lecture on decolonizing um, question mark. Um, this clip is devoted to explaining the sense in which um, uh, anthropology as an intellectual project inherently um, bears uh, super important, in my view, legacies of colonialism. Um, if you like, there's a kind of metaphor here. Uh, if colonialism is, among many other things, an act of expanding uh, into initially foreign alien lands and encompassing them, appropriating them within your own domain, uh, owning them precisely, uh, so expansion, this idea of expansion of these colonial powers into uh, continents and appropriating and encompassing them uh, and taking over um, with their own means and resources, the means and resources of other peoples. You can have something going on at an intellectual level as well. Um, so if you use your own way of thinking your own categories, your own procedures of thinking as a way of displacing uh, or encompassing or appropriating the categories, the procedures, the ways of thinking of a, another person or other people, you are metaphorically, but nevertheless very significantly, I think, uh, can be said to be intellectually colonizing, right? And of course, we've talked about last year the ways in which post-colonial theory and literature talks about these forms of, um, you know, the ways in which colonization takes place and root very deeply, for example, through language, uh, as Franz Fanon and, and many other post-colonial scholars uh, have argued and shown, right? So this kind of thought is not a thought that is uh, um, peculiarly developed within anthropology, but it, I'm, I just want to highlight this kind of kernel of, of an idea that you can colonize, perhaps in inverted commas, because it's not an act of physical appropriation and violence. It's perhaps deeper and more enduring for that. Um, but you can colonize people uh, through thinking, through the categories that you uh, inflict uh, in your interaction with people. Um, and in that sense, you know, you can talk about intellectual or even conceptual uh, colonialism. And this is really the point of departure of that whole line of thinking that I'm talking about uh, in the rest of this lecture, um, is that if that is the case, then are there also ways to decolonize anthropological uh, thinking? But the point of the present clip is to show the ways in which anthropological thinking is colonizing in that sense. And to do this, I'm going to return, of course, to the diagram that I've been using since the very beginning of this course. And it hasn't been an accident because in a way, uh, you know, I've been preparing also the ground to make the argument that I'm making now. Um, um, I've got a slightly different version of the argument here. And as usual, frustratingly, my, my mug, uh, my thumbnail mug interferes with a legend on the bottom right corner, which reads Nature, History, Geopolitics. Uh, but we've seen this diagram again and again in different forms. And you've got on the left the culture or society of the anthropologist and anthropology as an activity within that culture or society, the blue, the blue circle. And then you've got the culture or society of the interlocutor on the right, who um, and the object of study that the anthropologist might choose to study belongs to that cultural society. And then, as we've seen throughout this course, throughout the 20th century, it was felt that, roughly speaking, there were kind of two options on uh, how to conduct a kind of anthropological engagement between those two positions, right? One is the uh, explanation-oriented approach, uh, which is an attempt to explain the object of study by referring it, whatever it might be, to a level that is in some way cross-cultural, cross-societal, perhaps universal even. So natural or historical or geopolitical factors and considerations 
might be appealed to in order to advance an explanation of the phenomenon that you're trying to understand as an anthropologist. Or alternatively, the more meaning-oriented approach that we saw associated, for example, with American cultural anthropology, uh, which sees fundamentally the activity of anthropology as a form of interpretation and cultural translation, which doesn't refer to some universal um, level uh, or cross-cultural level necessarily of uh, reality that can form the kind of basis for an explanation, but rather sees the activity of anthropology as a kind of cross-cultural conversation, an act of translation, whereby we try to interpret the meaning of the object of study, the, the, the phenomenon that we seek to understand, I don't know, the cockfight in Bali, if you're Gitz or whatever it might be, uh, by translating it into uh, terms that the culture or society of the anthropologist can assimilate and understand. So the anthropologist as cultural translator. Now, uh, this is, as I say, a kind of distribution, as I've said from the very beginning of this course, of similarity and difference, a kind of uh, way of conceptualizing how similarities and differences might feature in the activity of anthropology, which actually uh, um, relies on a kind of common sense ontology. Now, what is ontology? Let me explain it extremely simply. It's a study of what kinds of things exist. So if you say that the world um, that the things that we experience in the world around us consist of mental phenomena and physical phenomena, the kind of dualism that we associate with René Descartes, for example, you're making an ontological statement. Now, if you make a statement that says that anthropology has to understand similarities with reference to a reality out there, which is natural, historical or geopolitical, and it's the world out there, uh, that is refracted in different ways according to the different cultural perspectives that you might take upon that reality, you're relying an on, on an ontological distinction between reality and appearance or perspective. And that ontological distinction often in anthropology has been glossed as a distinction between what is natural or real and what is cultural or representational. There's the reality and there's the representation of reality. Reality is nature, representation is culture. You can have only one nature and you have many cultures, many cultural perspectives. So therefore we have two bubbles or two circles in this diagram and a single plane, uh, or, or which is the, the, the green um, uh, level to which um, explanations appeal, which can be nature, it can be history, it can be geopolitics, whatever you know your theoretical account might be. So, so much of the anthropological theorizing that we've examined during the course of this uh, lecture, of this um, uh, module, can be understood with reference to that ontology, that ontological distinction between appearances and reality, cultures and nature. And so on. And that's why this uh, diagram I've been able to use again and again to talk about Marxism, to talk about uh, structural functionalism, to talk about uh, phenomenology or to talk about um, structuralism or, or whatever it is that we've talked about from week to week. The idea of society, the idea of culture can be understood because it operates within this framework of thinking, right? Um, so this framework of thinking is the common sense of anthropology. But of course, where does that come from is a question that one might want to ask. Now, crucially, this uh, ontological common sense, I want to argue, is deeply uh, ethnocentric. I'll explain more about that in a minute. But it's also fundamentally colonial in the following sense. I would argue. This is the kind of argument that I would like to make. People like Eduardo Viveros de Castro have also made it. It's one of the readings that you're looking at. And many other people um, make this from different trajectories within anthropology. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's an argument that, that I think has relative currency in, in different theoretical positions in anthropology, right? Um, so when you try and advance an explanation of your object of study, 
and in doing so appeal to nature or to history or to uh, geopolitical dynamics. So for example, cognitive anthropology I've mentioned who appeal to the nature of the human brain. Marxist anthropology, interestingly, that appeals to the nature of historical uh, processes and dynamics. Uh, structural functionalism that appears, uh, appeals to the kind of um, organic analogy of how societies reproduce themselves as, as kind of organisms. Many theoretical currents that we've examined in this course take concepts that derive from the society or culture of the anthropologist and inflict them or export them through their explanations onto their object of study, which itself pertains to the cultural society of the interlocutor. Of course, that culture and society might be the same society as the society from which the anthropologist comes, right? Because so much anthropology is done uh, in, in a single society. You don't necessarily need to be traveling to the other side of the globe to do anthropology as was imagined in earlier generations. But nevertheless, however you configure it, whether it's anthropology at home or abroad, if you like, the act of trying to explain someone always at some level involves using your categories, your theories, your ideas as a way of accounting for what those people are doing, what they get up to and so on. So it's a way of using your resources and exporting them outwards onto the people that you're studying. And that movement of exportation and of encompassment, of using your ideas to gloss over um, not gloss, gloss over, but, but to refract through your ideas uh, the phenomenon that you're trying to explain is in itself uh, an act of conceptual colonialism is the, is the idea, right? So if I take, for example, um, my understanding of neurobiological uh, processes in the brain and how those relate to, to cultural uh, and social behaviours, and uh, uh, try to use that kind of frame of, of, of analysis to explain um, a particular ritual that I encounter as an anthropologist in, you know, a Christian denomina denomination in, uh, I don't know, Sweden. Um, so I try and explain what these people in Sweden are getting up to when they come together at church through uh, an argument that relies on on my uh, kind of scientifically based ideas of how the how the brain works uh, i'm effectively using those scientifically derived ideas um, to um, re-describe uh, and thereby analyze and explain the practices of those swedish people at, at church right so i'm giving precedence of my idea of my ideas and using them as the net uh, through which to capture, to use a kind of uh, colonial um, um, or kind of aggressive, perhaps, language, um, the practices that I'm trying to explain, right? So that's why there's the kind of blue penumbra around the arrow of explanation, showing that this is an expansion uh, of the position of the anthropologist, if you like, at the expense of the position of their interlocutor. And in that sense, it's colonial. Now, interpretation, you know, the other approach in anthropology, which does not appeal to some kind of uh, naturalized uh, unit level of universality, I would argue also suffers from the same problem. It's similarly ethnocentric um, and colonial in that sense. So remember the idea here is one of cultural translation. Uh, the anthropologists must sensitively uh, embed themselves in the context of meaning of the phenomenon that they try to understand. Again, think of the Balinese cockfight as the example, Clifford Geertz and his wife, um, you know, embedding themselves in Balinese uh, society uh, and slowly beginning to understand how the meanings that um, uh, make the, cock the activity of the cockfight make sense for the Balinese, um, a bit like a text might make sense all hang together and create a kind of holistic configuration that you might want to call a, a culture, right? Now, the act of interpretation, according to this way of thinking of anthropology, involves a cultural translation 
whereby the meanings that the anthropologist encounters in their object of study, which again can be in Bali or it can be where I'm right now in Camberwell, it doesn't necessarily make a, uh, a difference, are translated into the terms that the anthropologist and their society uh, or in their readers might understand. So, for example, when Clifford Gibbs does his famous analysis of the Balinese cockfight, he ends up with a conclusion that this is a story that the Balinese tell themselves about masculinity and aggression, if you remember, right? So the local knowledge and the local meaning of the cockfight is translated by Gids into terms that readers of that famous essay can understand in English in this case. Of course, another avatar of colonialism is the domination of English as a language uh, in terms of concept of masculinity um, and aggression and so on. Right. So this act of adopting another's point of view and translating it into one's own is again an act of um, uh, intellectual um, uh, or uh, conceptual colon colonization. Right? It is an act of uh, relying on the ability, the almost magical ability, of the repertoire of concepts and meanings that are at the anthropologist's disposal to translate uh, the concepts, meanings and practices that are at the disposal of the anthropologist's interlocutor. Somehow, miraculously, we're able as anthropologists to register the meaning of anything that we expose ourselves to ethnographically because the language that we have at our disposal is infinitely rich and able to translate it. So that language, in a sense, encompasses um, the, the meanings and the repertoire of meanings that um, the ethnographic material that we're trying to uh, interpret uh, presents to us. So again, there's an expansion, again, the blue bubble expands over from the position of the anthropologist and encompasses parts of the position of their interlocutor in a way that is analogous to the way that I described earlier for uh, the act of explanation. Both explanation and interpretation, uh, according to this um, argument that I'm making, have a conceptually colonial, um, irreducibly conceptually colonial uh, aspect uh, to them. Indeed, the point um, that ultimately englobes the, both of the points that I've just made is the point that the very diagram that allows for these different possibilities that I've been outlining throughout this course has its roots in a bit of the diagram that corresponds to the society and culture out of which the activity of anthropology has emanated. These colonial metropolies of uh, of Britain, France, the North America, uh, Europe, uh, and so on, Australia. Those centers that created the discipline of anthropology uh, created it in their own image, if you like, because it's in those societies that difference and similarity are organized according to this set of concepts, such as the distinction between nature and uh, cultures, right? So I've put here the diagram within the diagram <laughs> uh, and shown that in that sense, the whole activity of anthropology is an exportation of the ways of thinking of the anthropologists uh, onto ways of acting, thinking, behaving, going about life that might be very, very um, different possibly, uh, possibly to those that the anthropologist in their very activity of doing anthropology takes for granted. If anthropology is going to be um, a study that is able to uh, deal with and uh, interact and engage with uh, all the possible positionings that human life throws up, then it has to overcome these uh, forms of thinking that are ensconced in only a very particular genealogy that belongs to Europe, North America, and so on, as uh, I've described throughout this course, right? The roots of these distinctions in Germany, in France, is something that I've been talking about uh, in each of the lectures that we've been encountering. 
So where we have to leave it is with a big X, <laughs> a kind of eh, eh. <laughs> We can't use this diagram anymore uh, the way that I understand it uh, as a way, as, as a point of departure for anthropology. We have to reconfigure the way that we imagine the, the activity of anthropology itself. We have to break out of these cardinal coordinates, that distinction such as the, as the distinction between um, society and culture, individual and uh, sorry, um, nature and culture, individual and society, mind and body, subject and object, um, a whole array of distinctions that make, that kind of provide the infrastructure of anthropological thinking need to be critically displaced for a kind of decolonial uh, anthropology to be able to emerge. That's the kind of argument that someone like Eduardo Viveros de Castro is making very explicitly. Um, and um, let me therefore just clip, close this clip by drawing attention to the use of the word ontology here, right? So I mentioned in an earlier clip that the, that the, that the line of thinking that I'm outlining in this lecture has been tagged as the ontological turn in anthropology. And part of the reason for that is precisely that it diagnoses the problem of anthropological thinking as an ontological problem. It's a problem to do with the categories of what kinds of things exist that format the way that anthropology thinks of itself as an activity, as an intellectual project, right? So if, for example, the ontological distinction between nature and culture is foundational to so many um, possibilities of thinking within anthropology throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century, as I've argued, right, then it's that ontology that needs to be shifted, needs to be turned. So the ontological turn is an invitation to rethink and to render vulnerable the ontological premises of, uh, of anthropology. And in some ways, one might say the, that ontology here is really just a synonym for, for, for concepts. It's the concepts, the basic concepts that anthropologists are taking for granted in the way that they build the activity of anthropology. So the concept of nature, the concept of culture, the concept of society, the concept of the individual that need to be radically uh, questioned. Um, and in as much as these uh, concepts tag the ontological infrastructure of the discipline, what we require is a radical conceptual critique, a, ra a radical conceptual reform of the discipline if we are to decolonize it. That's the kind of idea that we're talking about here. So I leave it there uh, in order in the following two clips to give you just a couple of examples of what that might look like.